Okay, so in this talk, I will focus on a growing movement in open access publishing in the humanities, namely scholar-led presses. So over the last decade, progressively more academic-led initiatives have been set up within a community setting to challenge the commercial hegemony in academic publishing and to provide a real ethical alternative, bottom-up, pluralistic and community-led, to stimulate diversity in the publishing ecosystem. So I will discuss two projects or communities in particular in this talk, the Radical Open Access Collective and Scholar-led. So in the first half of my talk, however, I will frame this movement based on two earlier published co-authored publications. So the YISC report on the left, which I co-authored with Graham Stone, and an article I co-wrote with Samuel Moore, uh, which was published in the journal Insights. So last year, YISC released the report Changing Publishing Ecologies, a landscape study of new university presses and academic-led publishing, which is authored by Graham Stone and myself. Um, now, next to a survey of new university presses in the UK, uh, the report includes a landscape study of academic-led presses based on interviews with 14 international presses, including open book publishers, Punctum Books and Language Science Press. Now, the goal of this study was to map existing initiatives, many of which have been set up in the last five years, and to find out more about the challenges they face and their needs and requirements. So this to formulate recommendations on how to better support already established scholar-led presses, but also to develop strategies based on knowledge sharing to make it easier for academics to set up their own presses to further promote diversity in academic publishing. Now, based on the research conducted for this report, we formulated several motivations and characteristics with respect to academic-led presses. First of all, although almost all scholar-led presses came about due to the perseverance of strong leading figures, most are community-based, connected to or established out of research groups, conferences, blogs and journals, for example. So often they face a lack of institutional support uh, to set up a university press, or the editors were distributed over various institutions. But independence and autonomy were mentioned as important motivations too, having not to deal with institutional risk averseness um, and accommodating better what scholars want instead of what their institutions or funders want. So collaboration is seen as a main value here, both internally and externally, where these presses support each other in various ways too, from providing advice and support to publishing or collaborating together. Now, secondly, most presses were set up as a reaction to a situation and context in which open access to scholarly materials in the humanities remained and remains restricted. So open access was already common in journals in the sciences, but not yet for books. So as academics, being personally affected by the lack of access to research materials was an important motivator to set up one's own press. However, next to the lack of open access content in the humanities, it was also felt that the open access publishing that did already exist was not being formally recognized. So thirdly, most scholar-led initiatives share a dissatisfaction with the ongoing commercialization of scholarship and express frustration with the prohibitively high profits made by commercial publishers. There exists a shared feeling that the book prices and BPCs of commercial publishers were prohibitively high, coupled to a desire within academic-led models to create books that people can actually afford, both to publish and to read, making them also available to communities in the Global South, for example. Fourth, most if not all academic-led presses are not for profits and set up or incorporate as charities or as having a charitable objective. So there's an emphasis on the creation of a knowledge commons here and on using open licenses that allow both access and reuse next to a critical attitude towards the use of BPCs, although some presses do use BPCs. So part of this predominant not-for-profit stance also calls up issues around fair pay and the gifting of labor and volunteer work, which these initiatives heavily rely upon. So many academic-led press are conscious of the issues around free labor and are experimenting with alternative forms of recognition for the agencies involved in knowledge production and on redirecting the large amounts of free and volunteer labor that scholars already do for commercial publishers. Next, academic-led presses are also characterized by the kind of content they publish. So several presses were specifically set up to promote scholarship coming out of a particular field or a community, for example. So academics also profess the need to promote more emerging or avant-garde academic content. So still not enough presses allow scholars to 
produce research and publications that are multimodal or non-linear, for example. And this experimentation also extends to the publishing process itself, where various scholar-led presses are experimenting with new business and published models and with open review and processual research, for example. Finally, academic-led presses can be seen as an extension of their scholar directors or editors' own critical scholar work. So various presses mentioned that their presses and processes were based on an ethics of care, acknowledging the various agencies involved in the publishing process and positioning an ethics of care against the logic of calculation that tends to dominate both academia and commercial publishing nowadays. We also asked the scholarly presses about their needs and requirements. So one of the most pressing needs they have concerns distribution to libraries. So integration into and distribution to libraries and bookstores is a very involved process, made even more difficult by libraries often not having a mechanism to deal with open access works. A service that looks in, in how to bring the content of academic-led presses into catalogues, in other words, some sort of matchmaking uh, between, support for matchmaking between libraries and academic-led presses, to draw the attention of subject librarians to their content would be very useful, it was felt. Financial and labor issues top the list of enduring problems. So support with various financial aspects, from incorporation to taxes and accounting, would be helpful in this respect. And labor issues were uh, regarded as severe, with scholar publishers having to deal with stress and burnout due to the lack of support staff, next to not always having enough time themselves, which is directly related to the fact that they do not have paid positions and take care of press issues alongside their academic jobs. So this means presses can often only take on one book at a time, which makes it hard to plan ahead. So funding of content, even small amounts, or one of funding for a book, would be an easy way to support both their enterprises and the more diverse ecology of publishing, it was well. So preservation and metadata were likewise seen as big issues where most presses do not have a systematic preservation strategy in place and keep digital copies of publications on servers, hard drives or in cloud storage. So some of the larger or more established presses do make use of services such as Locks, Clocks or Portico. And ISBNs and DOIs are quite common um, as are uploads to repositories and preservation of print copies through national libraries. So legal advice around licensing and contracts was an area where presses also required further support. So clear and easily understandable advice uh, on the different forms of copyleft and copyright and their relative merits. And more specifically on the drawing up of author and journal editor contracts is an area that could be supported by a number of model contracts. It was felt where licenses were sometimes drafted in a rather ad hoc manner. And also with respect to the production process, academic-led presses welcome a move away from corporate partners dominating all aspects of production. Where, for example, many presses complained about the reliance on cloud tools and commercial software, such as Adobe InDesign, Lightning Source, Ingram, CreateSpace, and Amazon. So using these is not in line with the politics of many of the scholar-led presses, where they would prefer open source technologies instead. Finally, there is the, need, uh, the issue of the need to legitimize scholar publishing as a model, where awareness is often limited amongst funders and academics looking for a not-for-profit open access alternative to publish their next book. So when we're examining these needs, uh, we need to take into account that a clear contrast exists between the more established presses and those starting up or at the planning stage, where the newer or smaller initiatives showed more of a need for support related to almost all of the points mentioned here, whereas the more established presses profess more specialized need, as they had already found solutions for many of these issues within their publishing workflows. We also need to understand that these issues notwithstanding, these initiatives are publishing books, so they very much just get on with it. So two main recommendations came out of the YISC report. So one concerned the creation of a toolkit, uh, which could potentially involve an inventory of open source tools, technologies and platforms, various guidelines and how-to manuals, model contracts, funding overviews, etc. And scholar-led presses also called for the establishment of a collective, of a consortium or association, as this could upskill and legitimate their endeavors significantly. Now, both of these recommendations have been taken up by the Radical Open Access Collective. The Radical Open Access Collective, which was set up in 2015, is a community of scholar-led, not-for-profit presses, journals, and other, op other open access projects. 
So the collective promotes a progressive vision for open access based on mutual alliances between the 50 plus member presses and projects, seeking to offer an alternative to commercial and legacy models of publishing. So based on the contingent and diverse philosophy of radical open access, and in line with the recommendation of the report to YISC, the Radical Open Access Collective means to work towards a framework of resilience, of strength in diversity and in numbers. Now, Radical Open Access as a philosophy does not stand in, op in opposition to open access or even to more neoliberal forms of open access. It is more a repositioning of open access, bringing it in line again with its roots, with how it was initially conceived by many, where open access has always also been about rethinking scholarly communication and critiquing the hegemonic role and exorbitant profits of commercial presses. It is a response to an uptake of open access in which is positioned as merely another potentially profitable business model. So radical open access seeks to push back against the dominance of these market-driven versions in order to promote non-commercial, not-for-profit, scholar-led approaches to publishing. As such, radical open access positions open access as an affirmative and ongoing critical project. It's not one thing, not a model or overarching project, a specific philosophy or a set of principles. It consists of various groups, peoples, institutions and projects with their own affordances. It embraces experimentation with academic publishing and writing, with the form, content and process of academic knowledge production. It evolves a recognition and nurturing of underrepresented cultures of knowledge, from para-academics to precarious scholars and academics from the global south. So the projects experimenting with these, these more radical forms of open access tend to envision their publishing outlook with and as part of a relational ethics of care, recognizing we have a responsibility to all those involved in publishing process. Now this is also visible through the sharing of resources, of information, of skills and times. So building up the collaborative communal knowledge already available within the different publishing projects and gifting this to the community. So the website and information platform set up by the Radical Open Access Collective acts as a showcase for these unique visions of open access, but also hopes to provide information for those interested in starting their own open access project. So the site currently lists resources about the collective, including our philosophy, resources related to scholar-led publishing, and the directory of scholar-led presses. The information portal on the website provides a curated list of articles on topics related to scholar-led publishing, from publishing tools and funding opportunities for open access books, to marketing and editorial advice. The collective also runs a mailing list, which is an informal location for strategizing and discussing specific queries related to open access. Now, the Radical Open Access Collective embodies what Samuel Moore and I have characterized as horizontal forms of collaboration, of forging alliances between small independent projects. So this is an important step in creating economies of skill and in providing mutual aid and logistical support, shared services and best practices. But what the Radical Open Access Collective also sets out to do is be a starting point for more vertical or multi-stakeholder collaborations that form another important strategy in making not-for-profit independent publishing more resilient. So this includes collaborations involving libraries, universities, funding agencies and infrastructure providers, all with a shared interest in the public value of knowledge. Here there is scope for thinking of the various not-for-profit entities within scholarly communication as potential community partners in the emergent open commons of academic publishing. The aim then becomes to realign the existing resources in the system of academic publishing and to direct them to alternative not-for-profit collaborative models. In what ways, then, will these initiatives be able to become resilient whilst, as I would call it, scaling small? So due to the size and often not-for-profit background, scholar-led open access projects do face various structural constraints. What is important to note here, however, is that these projects tend to work according to capacity, from a few books a year to several dozens, in order to keep it manageable for the people involved, which is also easier to achieve without a profit motive. However, when taken together in different constellations, these independent community-driven projects do have the potential to create a resilient ecosystem to support the scholarly commons. So the diverse constellation of agencies that have emerged out of these open access publishing experiments in the form of collectives, publishing cooperatives and purchasing consortia have the potential to further transform academic publishing from not-for-profit to low-cost collectively underwritten models. 
So working from individual projects to contributing to collective and collaborative ones will allow these projects to retain their independence and to honor their not-for-profit character, whilst providing a scalable publishing model that aligns with the ethos of scholar-led publishing. Here, operating communally might aid in overcoming both structural and strategic disadvantages while maintaining diversity and providing a framework capable of making publishing more resilient. So one important way in which scholar-led presses have proven to be resilient is in bringing down costs. So one of their main motivations has been to show that it is possible to publish cheaper and faster than traditional publishing outlets. So open book publishers provide a good example in this respect, bringing costs down by at least a third compared to legacy publishers by using alternative distribution channels. So many scholar-led presses working in non-competitive fashion have also been very transparent about their finances, as we can see from examples on this slide of writings on the cost of publishing and of running a press these presses have produced, to share knowledge on this front, but also to show how cost savings can be made on a small scale. If they do use BPCs, they tend to bring these down, charge them according to what authors or their institutions can afford, or they waive them completely where needed, next to achieve actively helping authors to find funding for their books. There's also an active focus on using, building, and sharing open source tools and platforms to make publishing more efficient, to reduce reliance on commercial solutions and intermediaries, and to create cost efficiencies into the system. So this effort towards resource and skills sharing characterizes the largest goal-led publishing community as a whole, where there is a focus on knowledge sharing overall and on mentoring of smaller or new initiatives, of co-publishing and community and consortium forming on various levels. So we see this emphasis on collaboration also in experiments with publishing models. So from the communal editing models favored by Open Humanities Press and Language Science Press, to a focus on getting the community of readers more directly involved through crowdsourcing and donations, as well as other collaborations and funding arrangements with public not-for-profit institutions, such as libraries and universities, who have similar motivations towards the open disseminations of scholarly content. So the newly formed Scholar Lab intends to set up and expand exactly these kinds of collaborations and relationships. A consortium of six scholar-led academic book publishers, who all are also members of the Radical Open Access Collective, this group of presses came together as part of the Open Air Funded New Platforms project. As a consortium of more established scholar-led presses, they aim to together develop new tools, workflows, infrastructures and processes to support the consortium as well as scholar-led publishing more in general, next to setting up new vertical alliances that will further support not-for-profit publishing more in general. As such, the consortium is actively involved in attaining funding to resolve some of the most pressing barriers that are preventing small publishers from interfacing with large-scale infrastructures. So existing infrastructures for the discovery, distribution, and archiving of scholarly books have been designed primarily for commercial, large, non-open access publishers. So this often renders them fundamentally inappropriate for open access content and for small scholar led publishing initiatives which are operating independent from large commercial publishers. So building up from a shared catalog, we are therefore working towards streamlining processes for the creation of metadata for the consortium and better integration of open access titles into a library catalogs. We have created an open source collaborative conference presence and book stand and are actively exploring how we can better archive multimodal monograph content. So as such, we are working towards a collaborative rather than a competitive ecosystem which next to stimulating innovation in digital knowledge production will support scholar-led presses to scale in a horizontal manner by building alliances with other not-for-profit uh, players, including libraries, universities, and university presses. Yet this isn't simply a project that wants to slot scholar-led presses into existing systems and infrastructures, that wants to turn scholar-led publishing into just another publishing model and integrate it into existing systems. We aim to thoroughly rethink these systems and how they currently function. What is needed to enable this is first and foremost a reimagining of, uh, of what academic collectivity, community, and commonality is and could be in a digital publishing environment. So new forms of collaboration need to be imagined. Reimagining the relations within the publishing system beyond the more, mere calculative logic, focus on assessing the sustainability of alternative models, is essential in not-for-profit open access publishing environment in order to enable new forms of collaboration and to redefine the future of scholarly publishing in communal settings. Thank you.
Um, sorry for taking 15 minutes more of your patience to jump into the Plan S. I know it's very highly anticipated to have this discussion, so I will be really quick. Hopefully 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I'm a quick speaker, so uh, hopefully that works. Out. Fine. Let's see if it, this works. No. So uh, I will be talking about uh, library-based um, open access uh, publishing and support, um, what we're doing at the Utrecht University uh, Library. Um, and I will also uh, address some of the challenges and opportunities with non-ABC models um, and do-it-yourself, I call them do-it-yourself uh, publishing platforms. So this is the library location in the inner city. First, I will um, jump into some facts and figures about the APC market. We already discussed uh, this, uh, and, and, and Stuart addressed this all also uh, yesterday, Jean-Claude Guidon. Um, then I will talk about the, the UOpen journals, um, then some challenges and opportunities, and then something about the do-it-yourself uh, platform, platforms. Something about uh, where we came from, um, maybe some of you, uh, at least the OASPA mem members, the old ones, uh, know us uh, as one of the founding uh, members of OASPA. Um, and um, we already uh, committed ourselves, now starting in 2003, four uh, on open access publishing. Um, and we started uh, the publishing services, it's called Igitur, it's not Igitur anymore. Um, if you look at 2015, we've changed the model, we, um, in 2014, we ran 25 plus open access journals uh, using OJS, um, PKP software, um, uh, in-house, so the hosting was done uh, within the library. Um, and that was the moment that we uh, needed to change our thinking of uh, how we could uh, help the, uh, the academy um, uh, and the researchers in um, open access journal publishing. Um, and we did it differently. Uh, instead of um, establishing like a, a real university press or uh, a new model university press, um, we have another model uh, implemented and that's the incubator, but I will come back to that later on. So, um, and I should say that we have um, now drafted um, a final version of our open science program, which will be implemented um, today, tomorrow, next week, anytime, um, for the next three years, so that's really exciting uh, as well. So, setting the stage, and we already heard something about this, huh? um, it's, it seems to be all APC focused, if we talk about open access uh, publishing. Uh, um, studies are being done for a while now, starting in 2012, uh, starting with 1300 as an average APC, now it's 17, 1800 dollars, even uh, some studies say uh, 2000 and plus. Uh, increasing ever since. Um, and the majority of APCs are paid now for uh, hybrid OA. Um, so, some more facts. I checked the day OAJ uh, last uh, yesterday. Um, and um, 12, over 12,000 uh, journals uh, in there at the moment, and uh, over 3,000 uh, are APC-based, um, which makes 73.6% of the listed open access journals in DOA, DOAJ uh, non-APC, apparently. And there is more, because the DOAJ isn't covering all uh, open access journals. Um, there are a lot of scholarly-led, for instance, uh, journals uh, being run by, by scholars, communities, small communities which aren't listed in the DOAJ yet. So it's, I guess, even more. Um, sorry. Um, but you, I should say that uh, the majority of articles uh, 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 being published um, in the, uh, the, the other 12 percent, uh, 27 um, uh, percent, uh, are of course from PLOS and the Biomed Central Frontiers, those full OA um, publishers. And uh, we already heard something about the offsetting deals in the Netherlands, or the read and publish deals, as they are called also, um, and in the UK. Um, they're all based on APCs. Um, and even the European call, the, the Commission uh, call on the Open Research Platform, uh, basically in the call, it's all budgeted around the idea of per article, and we have to charge an APC. So that makes you think, 
how the hell uh, does uh, the 73.6 percent doing this publishing thing? And uh, today we have Plan S, uh, another thing, uh, upheaval, uproar in the publishing world. Oh my God, what to do about the hybrids? Um, and it tends to go, the discussion tends to go again immediately to the ABC publishing. And I guess we should also mention alternatives and alternative ways of, of uh, financing open access publishing. So, um, huh? uh, also discussed uh, um, uh, yesterday, uh, mentioned uh, a few times, as scholarly communication evolves and um, academic publishing therefore evolves as well. So, uh, what are we, libraries, um, uh, institutions are prepared to pay and uh, for which services are we doing this? So, um, what can academic community, communities, researchers, uh, we already heard some initiatives by uh, Janneke, libraries, I will jump into that, and institutions and funders, and I guess we have a discussion on that um, uh, within a few minutes. So, I will jump into uh, our case, um, which is called, we are now called You Open Journals. Um, and we currently run 14 uh, full open access journals um, on the platform. And we um, do this for mainly the Utrecht University community, but we also publish journals um, which, has a, which, which uh, have a tie-in into the academic, of, uh, the academic um, uh, of the research background of the university. Um, but there should be a connection with Utrecht. That's important. So that's one decision we've made. Um, back in the days, we were open for all kinds of journals. So we sort of um, yeah, shrank down um, the focus. We partner with Ubiquity Press and are using their partner platform uh, uh, run, by, uh, run on OGS uh, software. Um, and in this incubator, uh, it applies a temporality, a temporality. Um, so we um, uh, set goals and um, we give journals a maximum of six years uh, to reach these goals. Um, either financially, have quality for instance, we uh, give the journal six years to, to build up their reputation, um, find out what the best model or publishing model would be, um, finding money, etc. Et so our aim is full gold. After these six years, those journals need to fly out. We call it fly out, uitvliegen. Uh, they need to exit the incubator and hopefully go to a publisher or do-it-yourself kind of thing. Um, so our aim is that when they fly out, they need to stay full OA. Of course, uh, um, we see that uh, sometimes publishers are really interested in, in um, uh, specific journals, uh, but they, they currently run a hybrid model, for instance, it's negotiable, but we aim for the full gold option. But we, so we are not having our infrastructure uh, anymore. Uh, we have editorial support, but it's only the linking pin between all kinds of services, like typesetting, like the uh, uh, running the platform, all, all those questions. So we are more focusing on consultancy. So helping researchers uh, or societies to publish, to publish in OA. And we have no, yeah, uh, uh, expertise. We are currently running, running this incubator with three uh, people, myself. Um, I have a publishing background, and the other two also have a publishing background. Um, and we help the editorial boards with uh, what are the OA policies currently uh, uh, you need to look at, or editorial practices. Peer review, open peer review, all kinds of um, yeah, important aspects to run an open access journal uh, in a good way. So um, that's the consultancy role we are more um, uh, mo moving into. So uh, we have this, these 14 journals, um, and I always say we have 14 journals and we have nine, current, uh, nine models. Um, so some of them um, are funded by research institutions or a foundation. Um, we have society journals. We have even a journal running on adverti advertisements, um, at least partly. Um, faculty journals. So it's a, really it's a mixed bag, but I like it because it leads to experimentation. 
And uh, sometimes things will work, sometimes things won't work. Um, and it could eventually uh, lead to um, uh, a, a seize of the journal. That's also a possibility. So, um, yeah, it's a mixed bag. Um, that makes it also complicated to uh, 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 come up with structure, structured ways of, of working, but um, it's an interesting uh, playground in that, in that sense. So, some of the challenges um, we see, and also this concerns um, in the years of the IG tour, um, and, 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 and I see it um, well, yeah, almost everywhere, uh, these, these, these new initiatives. Um, sometimes uh, there's an in, in responsible behavior in terms of, for instance, the funding uh, um, commitment, short term, uh, uh, most of the time. So three years, sometimes two years, sometimes five years, but then afterwards, uh, uh, there is no funding, and there is an immediate danger, and then the the, the, the journal uh, uh, needs to um, um, do it otherwise or stop business. So, and what you also see is that for, uh, a research-led journal, researchers-led journal, um, I call it a business approach. Maybe that's not the right word, but um, we need to constantly make them aware of that running a journal costs money, and that you need to find money to. Uh, do the actual investments also for uh, the upcoming years. So that's also a thing that I that, that that's really um, uh, an issue. Knowledge gaps, of course, um, especially also in the publishing and editorial practices. So that's that's a lot of work to do. Um, but of course, hope there's always hope. Um, there are also opportunities. So. Um, what we see is that there are initiatives to look at long-term uh, commitments, and that's also in the in the Netherlands, for instance. Wilma already mentioned it. Alternative publishing platforms, uh, they are there. So they, we are looking with the institutions, with libraries, um, for for long-term um, um, uh, commitments to those pl platforms, for instance. Um, but um, there's also, and that's interesting. Um, Two things to mention is that uh, the expertise and consultancy, like myself, but also others, um, you see that that's flowing into the library as well. So libraries are becoming more proficient, really pro uh, proficient in um, this consultancy role, I think. And um, therefore, uh, this, these new players in these libraries can uh, play an important role, um, not to be a publisher, but to have at least a very good idea of uh, what's going on. Um, and then uh, the growing competitive market of publishing platforms, that's also an interesting um, uh, development. Um, uh, they are there for, 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 for you know, a, a, a long time, but uh, they were really small. And, but now you see that there is a, there's a, yeah, yeah, a huge um, uh, development and focus on um, these, these publishing platforms and these do-it-yourself um, um, platforms. So, um, I ran, I, I run, uh, uh, th th this is a crowdsource list um, uh, of um, publishing platforms. I now have listed 22 or something. Um, here we have examples um, uh, like uh, De Gruyter, they recently, uh, I think it was last year, they started Siendo, so white label their own infrastructure, and they make it available for researchers. Um, or s small journals or um, um, single editorial awards. Um, and there are a lot of them. So um, uh, it's, it's on the slide. This is a crowdsource list. If you have any ideas, you can go to this list and please add them. Um, I also uh, have some things about open, the open infrastructure principles, which is really important, I guess. Uh, or at least have an idea of what's propriety and what's open, an open infrastructure. So uh, please add any, uh, no, yeah, if you have any suggestions, uh, you can uh, um, um, follow this, uh, this link. Um, I want to mention two, I think, really um, great examples of um, uh, library-based uh, publishing platforms on a national scale. So in Finland, you have this journal journals.fi platform running on OGS 3.0. And in Denmark, you have um, Tichkrift, I don't know if that's the right way to pronounce it, but um, uh, 
also running on OGS 3.0, um, hosted by the Royal Library in, in the case of um, the, the Danish uh, platform. And the learned societies and, and some of the libraries are involved as well are running this journals.fi uh, platform in Finland. And it's huge. So on the Finnish platform, um, uh, 64 journals are, are, are running on that platform. And the majority is APC free. Um, 144 journals are running on this Danish platform. And also the majority is APC free. So these are developments. This is really new. The Finnish platform is all, only three years old. And the Danish platform, I think it's two or two and a half years old. Um, this is really an interesting uh, development to see how libraries, institutions can work together, um, hopefully uh, find some funding somewhere uh, in order to um, oh yeah, uh, uh, help, help researchers and, and editorial boards and journals to, uh, to, uh, 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 to, to publish and maintain and sustain their uh, open access journals. Um, this was it. Thank you. Um, any questions? But I guess we uh, take that take them uh, later on. Thank you. I'm going to start by doing something which I normally don't do, and that is to mention a couple of names because I'm very grateful to many of you who are present here today, and that's why I'm just going to mention a few people because I could have only developed Plan S with the help of you. And um, if I mention these names, I immediately mention Ralf and Georg from Max Planck Gesellschaft. They are sitting over there, I think, uh, together with Gerard Meijer. It's an enormous source of inspiration for me. Christina van Lieber, Gerrit from Eurodoc, Koen Moritz from the Young Academy, Daniel Spichtinger, who worked at the European Commission, was an enormous source of inspiration for me as well. Of course, uh, Liz from Wiley, Wim from Springer, uh, Stefan and Ron from uh, Elsevier, uh, Vic from Faculty 1000, Camilla and Fred from Frontiers, um, and I could continue, but these were people who really, for me, were essential. Saskia and Johan from TTOA, you mentioned as well, they played a very important role in helping me to shape Plan S. That does not mean that we always agreed, on the contrary, uh, but they helped me to shape Plan S and to also to detect where was the problem and how we could move forward to accelerate the transition to full and immediate open access. The second thing I would like to mention, after thanking many of you, is um, to apologize for not always being able to react to your mails or the input I got. When we presented Plan S on the 4th of September, things went crazy. We received on that same day 70,000 tweets and I received an avalanche of mails and phone calls. And uh, normally I try to get back to everyone who sends me a mail, as many of you know, but it was just impossible to do that uh, in the last two weeks because things have been uh, really going wild. Um, just perhaps a couple of uh, um, words about why I got this assignment and uh, why it is from the European Commission so important that we really move forward on this. We have been talking about open access already for years, 20, 30 years, and you're all familiar with all these declarations and statements that things need to change and we need to really move to full and immediate open access. And also the European Ministers for Science and Innovation of the 28 member states of the EU, they got together during the Dutch presidency in 2016 and said, well, we need really now to be serious about the transition to full and immediate open access, and by 2020, it should be settled. Well, then if you look at where we stand today, you see that we are not getting there by 2020. On the contrary, things are extremely slow. And that's why um, I was given this assignment to really look into the transition and uh, propose policy measures to speed up the transition. And this is a mandate which is given to me by President Juncker himself. I report directly to him and to the vice presidents, um, which also shows, I think, the importance which the European Commission attaches to open access. Um, I quickly saw where is the problem, but I also saw quickly where is the solution. And the solution for me was very clear. These were with the funding agencies. Because something which always surprised me in the whole big, nego big deal negotiations in many of the countries were that only in 7% of the negotiations, the funding agencies were there. 
And in most of the cases, they left it to the libraries and to the universities to sort it out with the big publishers. While at the same time, these funding agencies are responsible for, of course, the public purse. And they are the ones, as we have seen with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who can call the shots. So I very quickly detected the problem. Uh, we are not having a quick acceleration to full immediate open access. I also quickly saw who holds the key to the solution, and these are the funding agencies. But the funding agencies, of course, all said when I talked to them, well, we can only do it when we do it together. If we do it in one specific country, this is not fair to it's the others because this will not be helping our science community. We need to do it together. And that's why I developed uh, um, this Plan S, by simply talking to all these funding agencies across Europe and asking them, would they be willing to join a coalition uh, around 10 principles to really, for once and for all, push open access forward. And that's exactly what uh, happened. Um, we were able to get a coalition of some 11 funding agencies um, really motivated to move forward on open access. Um, and you have all seen these 10 principles of Plan S. It is not rocket science. It's very much a cut and paste from what the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is doing, who, by the way, you probably have seen it, issued a very nice statement of support to Plan S in the last couple of days. So it's not rocket science. It's very robust and very straightforward principles, but principles which are game changers. And the most important principle, which was on the previous slide, is of course if you get a, a grant from any of the funding agencies at national European level, you can only use that grant to publish in open access journals. That is the key principle. And then there are, of course, 10 other principles with regard to copyright, with regard to licenses, with regard to uh, uh, hybrid journals, which are very straightforward, quite bluntly formulated as a way to indeed accelerate the transition to full and immediate open access. Um, I found an extremely good ally in this endeavor, Plan S, with Mark Shields, who is the president of uh, Science uh, Europe, this European Federation of National Funding Agencies, an extremely dedicated and motivated and intelligent person who immediately said, let's join forces, let's do this together, and spend a lot of his time, he's a busy person, in uh, helping me to uh, roll out uh, Plan S and to indeed get support for it. I should also mention, since we are here in Austria, a key role which was played by the FWF. Um, Falk is here in the room as well, an amazing organization. Uh, the boss there, Clement Tochner, is also a champion on open access. So I'm also grateful very much to the Austrians who are hosting at the moment this event um, for their support. Um, now, who are these funding agencies who are on board? Um, they are listed here. Uh, we are still missing a couple of them. And as we speak, there are discussions going on in Finland, there are discussions going on in other countries, and people see if they can not sign up to it. And I hope, indeed, that this list will gradually grow. Um, this is not a fixed list. We hope that Coalition S, which is built around Plan S, is going to grow. I'm also in touch with the big uh, charities, the big foundations, like the Wellcome Trust, the Volkswagen Stiftung, Bertelsholt, uh, Bertelsmann Stiftung, uh, Gulbankian, Boudewijn in, uh, in Belgium, to see if also they cannot sign up to Plan S. And let's not forget, these foundations invest each year 5 billion euro into science and innovation. It's half the budget of Horizon 2020. So these are big players, so also going to work on them. Increasingly, we are also trying to reach out to other parts of the world to see if they also cannot uh, get on board because this needs to be a global coalition which hopefully then can accelerate transition to full and immediate open access. I will skip that one. First reactions. Um, again, on the first day when we presented Plan S, there were 70,000 tweets and there were all kinds of fora which started and blogs which uh, emerged and articles. And overall, they have been, I must say, extremely positive. Positive reactions from the science community, positive reactions from universities, uh, LERU, the European University Association, really big statements of support from, this, uh, from the science community. And of course, there's also criticism. 
because that would not be logical if there was no criticism. Eh? There are, of course, uh, uh, critical remarks made by the uh, publishers. There are critical remarks made by uh, certain scientists. And I think that's only fair because this is quite a robust proposal, which is a game changer. And it would, I think, be, uh, um, it would be very surprising if no one would oppose that or would have uh, critical remarks on it. Uh, I've put here a couple of these uh, uh, positive remarks uh, on, 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 on a slide. Very inspired uh, for me, inspiration was uh, Mrs. Vidal, the French minister. She was the first one who in July already, before we presented Plan S, gave her support openly at the big conference, the Libre conference in uh, uh, Lille. She was the very first politician who said, I want to personally commit to it. Also the UK government, uh, very outspoken, very quickly in support of Plan S. So it's just been amazing how many senior uh, persons have been signing up to it, including Commissioner Moyders, of course, but it's obvious I work at the commission. So I'm backed up by the uh, Horizon 2020 uh, uh, troops. Um, Besides all these, say, comments and reactions, a lot of them from organizations, uh, the STM, uh, LERU, EOA, what touched me most in all these reactions were the personal reactions. And I've put one on the slide here, and that's from a, a student in India. And if you read it, I think it speaks for itself. And I received a lot of these uh, reactions from individual scientists from Mexico, from Brazil, from Pakistan, from India, just, you know, being grateful for the work we are doing. And when I had to reply to all these hundreds of mail which I received, I give priority to those ones, because these were for me the most touching and the most moving. Um, so this is what I had to say, and I keep it short, Stuart, deliberately, because I think it's much more interesting that we have a debate afterwards, uh, because I want to hear your views. I want to see to what extent you can contribute uh, uh, to Plan S. My agenda is very clear for the next months. First of all, to extend the coalition of funding agencies, and I mentioned already the foundations, like the Wellcome Trust I would like to reach out to. I'm very grateful for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who signed up. Secondly, I want to look for many more statements of support uh, from organizations, learn societies, uh, uh, academies, groups of uh, researchers to really say we are behind you. And then we are starting work on the implementation plan of Plan S. There's going to be a dedicated task force created, composed of a lot of members from uh, Science Europe, and they are the ones who are going to, together with me, then work on implementation plan, which I want to be ready by the end of the year. And this will cover very clearly issues like what will be uh, the cap on the APCs, how long will we have a cap, so very clear um, uh, detailed uh, arrangements for implementing uh, uh, Plan S. I count on all of you to contribute to that. I count on all of you to continue the dialogue and uh, debates. And again, we will not always agree, but I know one thing, and if we do not take robust measures, we are having another 10 or 20 years of debates, and I just think we can't afford that. One final person I would like to thank as well, because I skipped a number of names I saw. Jasmine from uh, Brill is here as well, present in the room. So again, I may have skipped a lot of names of people who came to see me, uh, who inspired me, who gave me information, who told me how the world of publishing goes. And uh, again, uh, very grateful and sorry for if I did not mention the names of all the people who came to see me and sent me inputs uh, to help me plan S. Thank you very much.